Before, I wasn't affected that much when I first thought of climbing Kilimanjaro. And now, it's an immense, immense challenge. A lot of people climb Kilimanjaro every year, but how many people in the world that climb it have the challenges that I have? Today was the most grueling day I've ever had in my life and the most grueling hike. Uh, 2,500 feet in six hours. Man, <laughs> it was tough. There were a couple points where I, I wanted to start crying. I really had to hold back crying. There's one where I was tripping, I almost fell back and thank God for the African guys of Pulgers that they caught me several times and uh, <laughs> I said, oh shit, several times. <laughs> I'm not the decider of whether I swim or not, you know. There's God who decides how safe it is, you know. The mountain, the weather, uh, the train. I'm just worried that, you know, if I would let people down, you know, if I don't make it to the top. This is the highest that I'm going to get in my life. Okay, my name is Rebecca Defeck, and I was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in 1971. Well, interestingly, I was both a, a tomboy and a girly girl. I have two facets of myself even now. <laughs> so I had Barbie dolls and uh, the full dollhouse with all the even little silverware and the dining room table and everything. But then when I was uh, little, I preferred to play with trucks and stuff. You know, when the babysitter, I would go over to the babysitter's house. And um, I always liked being outside, you know, like digging back in the garden, making forts in the backyard. You know, my mom, I consider is more creative and artsy, so I got that facet. And uh, more of the, I don't know, wanting to look pretty, my favorite color is pink, those types of things. And then on the other side, you know, I get uh, from my dad about being out in nature and the outdoors. So I spent a lot of time with him uh, when I was little here on motorcycle. So we tour all over to Wisconsin and we'd go to different hiking trails and fishing and things like that. Uh, my parents were uh, bikers. <laughs> so no surprise, right, with uh, the name Harley. They were actually in the Hells Angels. In, uh, in Anchorage, and so uh, kind of a, a very big turmoil of a time. Uh, I think they were uh, divorced shortly, you know, when I was in the three-year-old range, and um, uh, my, my mom met uh, my stepdad, uh, Benjamin, and we moved around quite a bit. Grew up in Alaska. I uh, attribute most of my growing up uh, time to Juneau. We, we were actually uh, pretty poor, when uh, uh, growing up, I, I I literally didn't have running water till I was 12, um, and uh, you know we lived a very kind of a meager sort of life. Um, you know, getting water out of the stream. I remember just to flush the toilet, that kind of thing. So, um, uh, you know, as a kid, it didn't really seem any different to me than anything else. You know, I mean, I just did my thing. I was the only child uh, growing up, and uh, I was pretty uh, pretty independent. That kind of guy, so um, very happy. <laughs>
Looking back at it now, I think, why? What a, it, you know, what, what a, what a way to grow up, right? I mean, I wouldn't trade it for the world. I mean, it was certainly a, um, it, it was certainly a unique uh, way to to grow up. But then again, not, you know, after traveling a lot of the world, I mean, I see that actually, it, it's more common than we in America think. So, um, and and actually, I didn't find anything wrong with it. So. And I think that I was truly blessed. So. I, I, I would say that I discovered a boy's rather young. Uh, I must have been kindergarten. Uh, there was a boy that lived behind my house. His name was Matthew. And we were buddies. We were best friends. We had a fort together between his house and my house. There's a little woods area in between. And uh, I don't know, weekly he'd be sending, putting envelopes uh, of gifts in, inside my door, little trinkets and stuff and that I saved for a very long time. Um, so I guess that, and I have pictures, and we used to go to each other's birthday parties, and we used to do everything together. So around first grade kindergarten, that's when I discovered boys. I think the first time I saw Becky was checking out had a checkout stand at a local hardware store called Menards. Uh, Menards is a lot like a Home Depot in the Midwest. Uh, there she was. Uh, I was actually getting a job there. It was my fourth job. I worked myself through college. I, mean, I was really excited about this position, actually. It was uh, one of my better jobs for me. I was going to be working in paint and carpet, and uh, Becky was working uh, uh, you know, at the front desk. Well, uh, I used to hear that there's three places to meet your um, shoemate. Okay, one is church, two is the grocery store, and three is the hardware store. Well, we met at the hardware store. We worked together at Menards Hardware in Escanaba, Michigan. Um, I had graduated from college, so it was the, I worked a seasonal job for the Department of Agriculture. Um, and it, in the winter, there's not much there. So that's why I worked at the hardware store. And Harley had actually come from Alaska and he was going to school um, at the time and working three jobs. And I actually met him on his first day of work at the hardware store. She actually asked me out. I, uh, you know, and, and come to find out later, uh, she denies it, but, <laughs> but she asked me out. Okay, so we we uh, apparently she had some group ski thing going on. <laughs> I I think Harley and I might disagree on that. I think he thinks our first date was when we went downhill skiing, and it, it looked like I stood up because I invited to come with other friends. I was going with another girl that we worked with, and she was incredibly late. She didn't uh, she didn't show up for uh, three or four hours. And, uh, but a lot of the other people from work did and, and uh, were asking me, you know, hey, what are, you, what are you doing here? And I'm like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm waiting for Rebecca. And, oh, she stood you up, huh? <laughs> so I got a lot of that, right? So I think he, he considers that maybe our first date. And that's when we first really, really had a good time uh, on the trail. We spent all day together. We had a beautiful day skiing. It was absolutely gorgeous. It had to have been probably the best conditions ever there. It wasn't the greatest ski hill or anything in the world, it, but we had the best company. And we just had a great time. And uh, I, was, uh, I was very impressed with how, uh, you know, just how she could, how she could uh, be so uh, athletic and agile at the time and really uh, tell a good story. She was very... Uh, She's a very good storyteller. We had such a good time. It was marvelous. And that I could actually be myself. Um, there wasn't, I wasn't nervous or afraid to be myself, you know? And that's what I really enjoyed. And, and for many people, I did lots of people. And I'd never really experienced that before. I would say the only time I really experienced that is when I was a kid, back to that first boyfriend I had, you know, that was my best friend, my best buddy. And that's the kind of person Harley was. And um, I realized at that time, it's funny, my last year of college, I kind of got sick of dating. And I made a list of all the attributes that I was looking for in someone. And I prayed to God about that. And then I lost the list. And it's funny because years later, I found that list and Harley was exactly everything that was on that paper. 
<laughs> Mountain guiding is all about managing risk, and managing risk involves making decisions that uh, will ensure the safety of the group, but at the same time you're balancing the success in the summit. My number one job on this climb is to make sure that every single person on this trip is walking into the hotel lobby, cracking open a beer after the climb with all 10 fingers and all 10 toes, safe, happy, and a smile on their face. One of the most important things that we're gonna be doing is maintaining a slow pace. Uh, it's the number one rule in mountain climbing, big mountain expeditions. Slowing your pace and being methodic and strategic with your ascent will absolutely help your body adjust to the altitude. It's the cardinal rule of mountaineering. The porters, the local Chaga tribesmen over there, they have a, a, an expression, if you will, that they say to all the tourists, all the trekkers on the mountain. And in Swahili, it's simply pole pole, which means slowly, slowly. And every time these people are passing you on the mountain at high altitudes with three times the amount of weight on their head, literally on their head, uh, these folks will just casually uh, greet you and say, pole pole. In the Midwest, you hear crickets all the time in the summertime. And we had only been living in the Seattle area, I don't know, for a year, a year and a half or something like that. And all of a sudden I started to hear crickets at night and I didn't think anything of it because I was so trained and used to it uh, in the Midwest. And so one night, it was after the rain, it was pulling down rain. It, there couldn't possibly be been crickets outside. And so I started looking around our bedroom and the house said, where's the cricket? Where's the cricket? Because they're driving me nuts. There were no crickets anywhere in the house. So that was kind of the first clue that something was wrong. Whenever I talked to Harley on the phone, I was having great difficulty understanding them. So I thought it was just, you know, a crafty remote phone. Some family members mentioned they thought I was having a hearing problem, you know, whatever, deny it, you know. And then I went to work for uh, the City of Seattle Library downtown in the business office where it's more high pressure, you know. And uh, I was having difficulty hearing all the people calling, you know, which it was kind of informed because I was in a job where I had to take a lot of calls. Family again urged me that I'm losing my hearing and hardly kept telling me that he thought I was losing my hearing. I'm like, nah, nah, you know. Had my first hearing test in May or June of 1999. And the audiologist could not explain my hearing loss. It was the same as an elderly person. Head up two is a, a very rare condition. There's not many people with it, but there's actually a genetic mutation that causes overgrowth of benign cells in the brain that can cause masses, and those masses can cause symptoms. It's a Merlin gene or a Merlin uh, disorder where this this disorder, there's a proliferation of cells along the nerves or along the dura of the brain, the sac that the brain's housed in, that don't know when to stop replicating. And as a result of that replication, they cause, again, masses in various parts of the brain and the spinal cord. NF2, uh, neurofibromatosis type 2, is, uh, causes tumors to grow in the brain and the spine, the central, they primarily concentrated to the central nervous system. Now, it's not cancer, it's benign, however, the tumors, they grow. Since my diagnosis, my tumors were growing about one to two millimeters every year, or you know, every six months. And all of a sudden, in 2004, they mushroomed, and I had a whole centimeter of growth in just six months' time. Which, you know, it, that may not seem like a lot, but when it's in your brain, and these small pieces like the ear canal, or on these nerves, it, it's enormous.
when I, when I look at Becky's skin, and I see the profound number and size of these lesions, uh, I would expect someone to be perhaps in a wheelchair, um, not doing much of anything, uh, being housebound, and it's very hard to correlate what I see on those scans with what I see in Becky. She is dealing with daily headaches. She's dealing with vision issues. She's dealing with um, balance disorders. She can't hear. And again, in looking at her, you might not have the sympathy you would in, in a person after you look at their MRI scan and you realize that they have 30 masses in their brain and all those masses are putting pressure on nerve tracts and those nerve tracts are very vital to life's function and she's overcoming that, again, just by sheer will and determination. Um, most of the patients, like Becky, who have NF2, well, some of them are blind completely, most all of them can't hear. And it, it is a, it's a daily battle just for her to get through her day. So th the fact that she can climb a mountain, go scuba diving, is almost next to a miracle. I'm not sure I could do what she could do with the same amount of disease that she has to fight on a daily basis. On this trip to Kilimanjaro, we're going to be climbing the Machame route, which is probably the second most climbed route on Kilimanjaro. It's the by far the most scenic because we'll be doing a traverse of the mountain, going up through the Machame Valley, up and over a traverse along the Shira Plateau, and then joining the more what I would call regular or traditional routes near the Barafu Hut, and then continuing on to the summit. Uh, each day brings us through a new kind of ecological zone and uh, it keeps it fresh and exciting for everybody because you never know what's coming around the next corner. And when I was a kid in Upper Michigan, there's not really mountains. And so when I see the clouds in the morning on the school bus, I would fantasize they're majestic mountains. And I don't know why they just call me, call to me. I want to be up as high as I can get up. And Kilimanjaro doesn't, but it doesn't require technical skills like crawling over a crevasse, you know. And so for me personally, I think that's the highest that I can get in, into my ability. And it cost me. The beauty of climbing Kilimanjaro is, is that there's almost zero objective hazard, meaning uh, ice fall, avalanche, rock fall. With that said though, this is not a walk on the park. There is altitude, there is physical exertion. Uh, and in Rebecca's case, this is going to be incredibly challenging for her because of her ataxia associated with her NF2. She literally has a lack of coordination when it comes to climbing in or hiking in low light or darkness. And a big chunk of what we're going to be doing on Summit Day is in the dark. It's going to be extremely challenging for me. Uh, to be able to do this because I lack balance function and I get double vision within 10 minutes of strenuous exercise. So to be able to accomplish this is, is making a big statement to the world and bringing awareness of what I have. One of the key considerations or, or issues that we're going to be watching and managing throughout the trip is, is the, everybody's ability to adjust to altitude. Whether you're 100% healthy or not, you, uh, everybody's body adjusts to altitude differently. And just because you've been at altitude before doesn't necessarily mean you're immune or you don't get affected by altitude sickness. Ultimately, you're adjusting to the lack of atmospheric pressure up high in the mountains. And one of the, way, one of the effects of that is swelling. Um, your, your peripherals, your, your brain will swell, and Rebecca's doctors are uh, concerned about her brain um, because we all know there's only so much space in your, your skull for your brain to, to um, live. Rebecca has the added challenge of having a spindle of tumors in there that normally shouldn't be there. I want to climb these things not just for the satis my own satisfaction, but I want to do it for a purpose. And that's my mission in life, to have a purpose. And this is fulfilling my purpose. I'm doing it because I believe I can, and I believe I'm the person to do it for this cause and for us.
There are certain sections on the climb of Kilimanjaro that uh, present their own unique challenges, particularly on the first day and the last day of the climb, on the, the first ascent day. There are uh, sections where you're literally climbing up steep, kind of rain eroded gullies, grabbing tree roots. Mind you, doing this with a pack on, with trekking poles, it can be slippery and muddy in the rainforest. Uh, on the descent day, going down off the mountain, now you're actually walking down this type of terrain, which presents its own unique challenges. The whole crux of this entire climb is a section called the Barranco Wall. And the Barranco Wall is a very steep, uh, windy, single track type trail, meaning only one person at a time can walk. And by the nature of the terrain, you literally have to walk uh, on knife edge ridges. Um, exposed to several hundred feet of vertical terrain below you. Rebecca has challenges associated with balance, with vertigo, um, with double vision, um, bouncing vision, blurriness. So it's going to be incredibly important for her to be on her A game the entire climb. I called my mom and told her guys I investigated a weird lump on my neck. And they finally took a chest x ray. I was being you know, treated for asthma uh, for a month. And uh, the doctor called and said the x rays didn't look good. There was something, the mass, they couldn't explain. So they needed to come in. He didn't think so, but he said there was a possibility that I could have had leukemia. The whole time I, I was envisioning my funeral in my mind, you know, the, the day you know, my family surrounded is great. That's all I thought of. The whole time. Next thing you know, I was told, okay, we have to get some, a bone marrow sample. So they had to do this biopsy. So the next thing you know, I'm lying down and there, I see this huge needle. I hate needles. And uh, it was one of the worst pains I have ever felt in my life. Was, and they numbed the area, the skin, and the back of your hip. But I could feel the blood dripping down my back. It was just, you know, awful feeling. The final day of regulation, it was a wonderful day. It was bright and sunny, and um, I know I was able to get out and feel alive again. And so what I did is I just took off. And I, I took a ride over town. I was living off from Michigan to the uh, famed local Sugarloaf Mountain, and I went hiking, you know. It was something I hadn't done in so long. And it just, oh, I was so energized. It was great to feel alive again and be back to myself. I felt whole again. Becky had cancer before I knew her. Um, she warned me about this. She basically gave me a hall pass. She gave me an out. She just said, "Look, if you know if this thing starts going south again, you know we, you know I get I get this again. Just you can move on. It shouldn't be anything that you should have to deal with." I don't think I don't think that ever registered with me. Okay. That's right, number three. Hello. This is Kayla. That was Ricky. Hi, Harley. Hi, Harley. Take you, Becky, to be my way wife. To have and to hold from this day forward. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish for the rest of our lives.
Good morning. Good morning. How are you feeling this morning? Oh, I, I actually had a headache in the middle of the night. Uh, let's see, I got up maybe at midnight and had to go to the bathroom. Then I got up at 4 o'clock in the morning and my head was really hurt. So it was hard to evaluate if I was actually getting altitude sickness or if it was that I was really dehydrated. Because um, I don't think I drank quite enough water yesterday. And by 6 o'clock in the morning, I was still was having a slight headache. So I actually went ahead and took the Diamox. But I'm feeling pretty good right now. Tell, tell me about yesterday's hike and what was, what was challenging about it. Um, well, actually, I was, I was quite lucky that the, the trio was um, in better condition than I originally had expected. The challenging part was uh, some of the areas have really big steps. We're talking about, well, I don't know, a couple feet at least, which is really, really hard when you have imbalance. So I really depend upon my leg strength and to try to kind of balance and throw my weight forward, know how to uh, balance it just right so I'm not pushing myself too far forward where I'm going to fall or not falling back either. So actually uh, yesterday was pretty good and the hiking conditions were the most ideal for me because it was actually overcast all day and when it's overcast um, I have a better time with my vision. It's when the sun comes out and you have the depth of the sunlight hitting the trail that my vision really gets skewed and having it overcast I didn't have as much of a double vision problem so it was really good you know. All right, we'll see you on the trail today, and we'll talk to you again tonight. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> I specifically remember the day when she went deaf. I remember saying, this is it, this, it, it, it's done. I remember the day we were in California and uh, she had just gotten a, 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 a major dose of radiation to her brain and it had swolled uh, the tumor and she completely lost all facial function uh, on one side and she uh, lost her hearing completely, done, zero, none. Uh, we were standing on the beach and we both didn't know sign language. Mm, I'm trying to understand the situation, is learning medical terminology, and uh, what questions to ask, what are the right questions to ask, for the right decision to be made. What happens in this condition is these, these patients with uh, neurofibromatosis have multiple tumors and you can't stay ahead of it. You can't give enough radiation. You can't give or do enough surgeries to control these tumors. It's, it's like trying to stamp out a wildfire and you may stop the fire over here and another fire starts over here and you just you can't get ahead of this condition. So as you go out towards the lining, that's when you see them all, it's the lining. So the lining, lining, and then this is the brain that you don't really see them in the brain, but it's the lining. And then when you go between the right and left halves of the brain, this whole sheath is just forming little nodules. This one, this one, this one. So it's really this one. These little guys, they're nothing. It, there's, it's this one. This one's, this one needs to come out. That one needs to come out. It's, it's not like you would think a normal tumor would be, where it's just a, a mass, and you go and you cut it out, and that's that. Um, it's like you take a bowl of wet spaghetti, and you, and you take a bunch of peanut butter, and you mash it all together, peanut butter and spaghetti, and then you take a scalpel, and you just try to cut the peanut butter, but don't touch any of the spaghetti. And you can never get all that peanut butter out. And you're doing this under a microscope. The 
the fact is is that they can have a successful surgery and she could come out not being able to swallow uh, not being able to see and that's a success I mean that is a success that's hey we got it out or hey we got out what we could the, the time process for a person who has neurofibromatosis who has decided they are not going to try and remove any more tumors it, it can be over months to years you know these symptoms just slowly progress people uh, do lose their balance they lose their ability to walk they can become blind again because these tumors push down nerve tracks and so it's a it's a very slow process and um, and you know quite frankly it's it's very difficult for uh, the family to to watch it's not a quick passing I feel terrible to, to uh, keep putting you through this. I mean, what is this the third time, you know? Most of these people teach us a valuable lesson, and that is how to approach death. She, she knows. She knows how she's going to die. Most people don't know that. And that's a very unusual perspective in our society to talk about, to meet your death, to know um, what how the end may be, and yet at the same time not be so morbidly depressed that you can't find the joy of the moment. Who's the most stubborn of the three people on the boat? There's me, the devil, and who's the third person? Oh, God, okay. <laughs> who's the most stubborn? Uh, probably me. <laughs> One of the frustrations was learning how to hike at a slower pace, which I'm not used to, um, because with my imbalance, uh, I kind of have to walk faster to keep from falling over. Um, when I started walking again without a hiking pole where I was supposed to use a cane, um, it was easier for me to run than it was to walk. That's kind of why I got back into running. Uh, so with the hike, you know, you're, you're going, people are going one step at a time and stopping. I can't do that. I gotta have both feet together. So anyways, the first time that uh, I almost fell, I, I got very frustrated and I almost started crying. And part of it is the altitude, you know, lack of oxygen to the brain. And it just, I know, sad you. And, and there was a really scary train. Um, it's the most rugged train I've ever done in my life, and it's amazing that I, I made it up here. I, 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 I would not have been able to do that in the past six years, and part of what got me up there was six years of preparation and training for this. I, I would never have made it here without the help of my team, without the guides and the porters. Um, they're just amazing. It's incredible. I, I can't believe it. it's miraculous that I made it over that train today. Just absolutely miraculous. Is it harder than I thought it would be? Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> I'm going to make a mark on the left side of your neck there indicating the size of the operation. Oh, okay. When I first came out of the surgery last October, I watched the IMAX uh, movie of Kilimanjaro, and I saw the train they're going over, and I'm like, oh my god, I can't do that. And Hardy's like, you can do it. This is a shampoo cap. It's warm, and I'm like, shampoo in my head, you're getting all wet right now. <laughs> this is what all I know. Yeah. This smells good. This is the highest I've ever been in my life. We're at 12,000 feet. Um, so that's what's going on right now. Day two, and I've made it. <laughs> it's hard to believe I'm going in already. Yeah.
I'm not looking forward to tomorrow. Uh, I'm looking forward to the challenge of getting higher, you know. Um, I know it's going to be a lot of work, so in that essence, I would say I'm not looking forward to it. Well, I'm looking forward to his accomplishment. You pray. You you pray a lot, and and you and but this is how your prayers go. Your prayers go, God, please, don't let her, don't let her lose any more hearing. God, please, don't let her lose her face. Okay, God, I I, I can I can deal with with just some hearing. Okay, God. There's no hearing. I, I can deal with I can deal with her not having some balance, but please don't take it all. Please God, don't take her eyesight. You really have to believe that you're making the right choice. And then don't look back, full straight ahead. Never second guess a treatment decision. You know, why? You know, you beat yourself up for it. Once you make a decision, go with it. And just focus, focus on that. And you have to believe that things are gonna be great. For me, you know, I have to have a faith in God. You know, I, I honestly, I don't know how people would get by with that one. But whatever your faith is, you got to be strong on it. And we have to believe that it's better for you. I'm actually kind of excited with my faith here. You know, I, I, you know I'm pretty excited because I believe that I'm going to visit heaven. What happened on, on Kilimanjaro happened at a point earlier in the trip than I thought it was going to happen. If, if I were to have had to look into a crystal ball and, and guess what was going to happen, I suspect this was going to happen. I did not expect it to happen at the point that it did in the climb. Each day as we set out, Tim would tell us, you know, we think this should take a certain amount of time to get to the next camp. and. Um, as each day went, each day went on, it was clear that Becky was lagging further and farther behind. As she came into camp every day, her attitude was fantastic. You know, everybody was uh, urging her on and being supportive. Uh, climbing in those conditions at that altitude was not easy for, for any of us. But uh, as, as time went on, it became clear that uh, Becky was lagging further and further behind. What I experienced with Rebecca was um, a severe presentation, if you will, of, of lack of coordination and ataxia is the term for this. And it just seemed to come on late in the afternoon on the day we were descending from the sheer plateau down into the Barranco Valley, uh, about halfway through the trip. Rebecca, with every step you take on this mountain, your perseverance, will, and spirit continue to impress me. Even as NF2 has robbed you of certain physical capabilities, your spirit endures. I have no doubt that mentally 
you have the will and the fight that it takes to make the summit. It is apparent to me, though, that the physical limitations that NF2 has placed on you, the altitude is compounding these physical limitations as we observed yesterday as you descended into camp. This is something that's out of everyone's control, including yours. Your body is burning up energy faster, trying to compensate for this lack of balance. It's exhausting you. It's compromising your safety, my safety, and all the other guides' safety. The consequences of a fall are serious on this steep terrain. As the leader of this expedition, that's just not a chance I'm willing to take. Rather than expose you to these risks, we're gonna descend safely from this camp this morning and take our time. I know this is not the decision you wanna hear. I will understand if you and Harley will be angry with me, but my experience as a mountain guide has put me in this unenviable position in the past. But I rely on my experience and judgment to make these calls on your behalf, and that's ultimately why you brought me along on this trip. Tim O'Brien. When, when we found out that Becky is not continuing and uh, had, had to go down, um, it, she absolutely figured that she was either going to stay at camp or be the only one to go down and that all the rest of the group, including myself, were going to continue. Yeah, I remember there was a, actually a bit of a, uh, it, you know, a bit of a, a communication there between us having, you know, me to explain to her, no, no, we're, we're going down. Yes, there's people coming with. There's uh, eight that are continuing and the rest of the group is, you know, going with you and, and going down. She turned around, kicked everybody in the ass, go back up the mountain, said, uh, sent them on their way and told, told them to be strong and, and to make it to the summit. Don't give up. I'm not a poker expert, but I could tell you this, is that people win in poker with lousy hands. People win big. And why is poker on national television? Why is it such an interesting thing to watch? Because we don't know the outcomes. It's the same thing with life. You're given, you're given your hand. Play it. Play it to the best of your ability. You know why? Because you don't know the outcome. You're, you're given a whole set of random cards that you would that any normal person would would not take. But you know what? In the proper hand, in the proper situation, you could win the biggest pot in the world with it. We descended the Umbwe route, which is a, a traditional descent route. It's a very direct line off of Kilimanjaro out of the Barranco Valley. As guides, we, we keep it kind of filed away as an option in case somebody gets altitude sick or there's something really wrong because it descends fast and you can get them to lower altitude very quickly. You, you kind of have to bushwhack a little bit to get through certain areas, but it, it descends this ridge that just goes right on down into the, into the valley down below and gets people down low very quickly. I knew that I needed her fresh, ready to go. We left in the morning and we, we just took our time, took all day, all the way down to the, to the trailhead down there to where the vehicles were. When I took on this role, I was prepared for this scenario to play out. And I, I, as a mountain guide, I'm always prepared and understand that n based on the decisions I have to make as the leader of the trip, that perhaps some people might not like me at the end of the trip. Like you should. That's why one of the major reasons we went to Kilimanjaro. We didn't know if it would be our only shot to do it. So we wanted to grab the chance what was there. 
and you should always be ready. You should always be living it to your fullest. Whatever you decide to do, do it with all your heart. Go on and find your purpose in life. I think all oh, this has been my purpose, it's been a grand purpose. If one person has told me that they really, you know, I've really had an effect on their life, I feel I've served my purpose, and that makes me truly happy. Just hang in there and give it all, all heart, give it all you got.